Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you've been sitting in the back row, or if you're new to the channel and you enjoy what you're hearing, please show the subscribe button some love, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you are reminded of every time I upload a video. Also, if you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee, that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Let's Not Meet Stories. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I haven't shared this story, so I feel like now is the right time so that others can be warned. It's in the early 90s. I was six years old at the time, living with my parents and brothers in a duplex. The events of the night are still burnt into my memory all those years later. To get a feel for the house, we were in an end unit of the duplex and had a sliding glass door in our living room that faced the woods. The couch was up against the wall, half in front of the sliding glass door, but angled in a way to see the TV that was against the wall next to the sliding glass door. One of those big old tube TVs with the wood paneling. Friday night, my father had not come home from drinking, so me and mom camped out on the couch watching a horror movie marathon. I should add that my father would get pretty drunk and was super abusive, so my mom slept with a knife next to her on nights he would stay out late. It was a rough time for us, but we got through in the best way we knew we could. The knife was just a kitchen knife. That will come into play later. Anyways, back to the events of the night. We were watching Halloween, eating snacks, laughing, having an enjoyable time. We fell asleep around 10 p.m. on the couch, mom with her back to the couch and her cuddling me. The next thing I know, I awake to my mom screaming. This wasn't unusual in my house, as again, my dad was an abusive drunk. But when I opened my eyes, a tall, thin man in a black hoodie was standing over us. He wasn't my dad. My eyes met his, and I was frozen, but fast thinking for my mom. She grabbed the knife from the coffee table and lunged at him. He stumbled backwards and regained his footing and ran out of the sliding glass door. My mom jumped up, slammed the door shut, and locked it. She also called the police. When the police got there, they said he'd probably used a knife to pop the lock. They noticed a ton of cigarette butts that didn't match my parents outside the sliding glass door. The police said he was probably sitting out there watching us all night before getting the courage to come in. The police said they had several calls of a peeping Tom that matched his description in our complex over the past couple months. For whatever reason, he chose our house to be first. My parents got divorced shortly after and we moved in with my grandma. So thankful no more encounters. But still to this day, I check all the locks before I go to bed. I even check them twice and have a pole in our sliding glass door. Looking out a window at night still makes me uneasy that someone's on the other side, watching. Creepy weirdo standing over us. Let's not ever meet again. Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university and needed some extracurricular stuff. I could put in my entry applications. As most UK students know, one of the best to have on there is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition, basically a long trek through woodland and rural villages following nothing but a map and compass. No GPS allowed. 
It's a teamwork experience, and you camp and overcome hurdles together, etc. Anyways, I was out of shape at the time, so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight like what I would be doing during the real thing, but we hiked about 10 miles through the woods in a small village in pretty abysmal weather. By the end of the journey, we were soaked to the bone and pretty miserable, looking forward to getting back to the car and heading home. For the most part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill with bushes and trees on either side of us. We were marching onwards in silence at this point when all of a sudden there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush stepped out an old man in a black suit with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He looked late 70s, maybe early 80s, very pale, liver spots dotting his face and a gray-white comb-over. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that to go into the woods? The instant thought seeing a guy his age out there in those type of clothes and this weather conditions was the guy has lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice, though, that puzzled me. The man was bone dry. He didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be as frozen in shock at seeing us. My cousin made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking him if he was all right. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened, that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, which we did. We started off at a brisk walk, then escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After maybe a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him, so continued to follow the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom, motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down, and the slope was probably at a 40-degree angle, spanned for perhaps 50 feet or more, and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given there were no shrubs or roots to hold on to anything. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope and wondering, how in the hell did he cross that so quickly and so cleanly? I mean, at that distance, it is hard to see fine detail clearly, but I swear he still did not appear to be wet or muddy at all. Me and my uncle looked at each other, and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Despite my feelings, I made a step towards the edge and was going to try and make my way down when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and pulled me back. Under his breath, he said to me, Something is wrong here. We took a few steps back from the edge at this point, and the old man at the bottom started getting irate. He began pleading with us again to come down the slope, telling us he needed our help. His friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down to the old man that we would head back to our car and, and call emergency services for him. That professional help would be on its way. That they would have a lot more tools to help him, etc. The old man suddenly got furious. He began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down that slope right now or there would be hell to pay. His voice had changed drastically. He was practically growling his words, his hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knee like an angry toddler throwing a tantrum. I've never seen a grown adult fly into such a rage in all my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting 
out of their sockets, his skin gone from pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we came, his demands and threats getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter mile or so to the car. All the while, my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there was a possibly mental ill old man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get into our car and await the police so we could show them where we had encountered him. About an hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them and packs of supplies like first aid, emergency blankets, etc. We lead them down to the exact spot and then pointed the two officers with dogs in the direction he led us through the bushes. The search lasted all week, but there was no trace of an old man. Officers said the only trail they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man we encountered. It was one of the weirdest experiences to date. So, old man existing out there in the forest, I hope we never meet again. I'm a 36-year-old female in Sweden. I have worked in mental health care for the last 18 years, mainly with people with psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia. I was working at a group home for nine years and was very close with my coworkers there, especially two females. The last few years I worked there, another female started working there. Let's just call her M. And the four of us grew very close. She was very timid, shy, friendly, and we all got along well. She was, however, often on long-term sick leave because of her own mental health issues, so we didn't meet much at work. But she always showed up at our after-work dinners, so we continued to stay in touch even when she wasn't well enough to work full-time. She told us that she had a history of schizophrenia herself, just like the patients we were treating, but that she was medicated and hadn't had any psychotic episodes for years. Since I have an education in psychiatry and a long experience with schizophrenia, I have no judgment towards people suffering from the illness, and it didn't bother me being friends with someone who was diagnosed like that. And even after what I will tell you, I still feel the same way. In the summer of 2023, I had moved on to work at a new place, also within mental health, but this time forensic psychiatry, like a halfway house for mentally ill murderers, etc. The four of us stayed in touch and still met every now and then for dinner parties, and told us that she had been evicted from her apartment because of an incident where she had accidentally entered our neighbor's apartment in the middle of the night. She told us that in the huge apartment complex, the doors all look exactly the same and that she simply walked into the wrong door by accident and that the neighbors had created a scene of pure drama and reported her to the police. I somehow felt that while that sounded out of proportion to evict someone just like that, perhaps the landlord took that kind of action because he judged her based on her medical history and I really did feel bad for her. I questioned her if something else happened, and she claimed that it didn't and that this was the full story. In Sweden, it's very difficult to get a contract for an apartment when you have gotten evicted. You pretty much get blacklisted. M asked me if she could move in with me. Since she was already on the street, literally homeless, I said, yeah, of course she can. I've always gotten myself into uncomfortable situations by saying yes instead of thinking about myself. And I had no idea how severe this situation would get when I said yes to M. I live in a pretty small apartment. It's a one-bedroom 
that pretty much only fit the bed and a desk, a living room that fit the couch and TV, no room for an extra bed, a small kitchen and a small bathroom. Also, I have two cats. We decided that M was going to live in the living room and offered her to throw my couch out so she could have a bed there. But she said that she would be fine sleeping on the couch since it's comfortable enough. I insisted on giving her a bed, but she kept declining. There's a door between the living room and bedroom, but between the living room and hallway, there's just an open valve, so she wouldn't have total privacy. I hung up a thick velvet curtain covering the valve, so at least gave her the sense of a door and more privacy than nothing. There's another door from my bedroom to the kitchen, so I have two doors to my bedroom. I have to have one of them open at night since my cat wants to go in and out, and they also have their litter boxes in the bathroom and food and water in the kitchen. I naturally kept the kitchen door open and not the living room door since that's where M lived and we wanted to keep our privacy somehow. She wasn't working at the time because she was on one of her long-term sick leaves while I was working shifts so sometimes I had to get up at 6 a.m., and sometimes I didn't get home until like 11 p.m. I have really severe insomnia and need to combine Ambien and Promethazine. And even with this, I still wake up easily. I told her that I would appreciate if she could try to stay quiet those nights when I have to get up at 6 a.m., but that it's fine if she's loud when I'm off work or when I do the evening shifts. She was a heavy smoker and a coffee drinker, so I bought her a coffee machine. Yeah, I know, I'm a weirdo who doesn't drink coffee very often, so I didn't have one, to make her enjoy her living situation more. The coffee machine and the sink is placed right outside my bedroom door. The kitchen is very small, so the first night together, I had to get up at 6 a.m. for my shift. As usual, I had a hard time falling asleep. M had been up several times that night to go out to smoke, and I woke up every time. At 5 a.m., she started making coffee, and since it's literally outside my bedroom door, I was wide awake from the sounds of it. I asked her in the nicest way possible why she was up this early, asking if she had any plans today. I mean, she's on sick leave. Why not sleep at 5 a.m. if you can? And she just said that she couldn't sleep. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I would just appreciate it if you could wait with making the coffee at 6 a.m. Since I really need this last hour of sleep because of work. Adding to why I need my sleep is that I have epilepsy that gets really bad when I don't get enough sleep. I usually get a lot of seizures when I don't get at least four hours of sleep. I knew that I would probably get seizures at work now, meaning that this day would be both stressful and potentially dangerous for me, since there's a huge risk that I may fall and hurt myself. And it's not a good thing to get cramps and seizures among mentally unstable criminal clients who you are supposed to care for. I know that it's not an ideal situation to work in that field with my condition, and I can inform you all that I did quit after only six months. She said that she really wanted coffee with her cigarettes, but that she would try to wait the next time I have to work. I accepted it and went on with my day, but things didn't get better. She continued to wake me up early in the morning and through the night and continued to promise to stop, but insisted that she really wanted coffee with her cigarettes. I suggested making the coffee the night before or drinking iced coffee or Coke instead, but she didn't want that. I may add that she demanded for me to be silent at 10 p.m. because that's when she wanted to sleep, and I respected that. She used to get those moments of binge eating where she would empty my fridge and pantry for everything I had. 
I remember this one time when I had bought a big loaf of bread, and she texted me 30 minutes later. I left the apartment saying, Hey, I'm sorry I ate your loaf of bread. I will buy it back once I get money. Like an entire loaf of bread in 30 minutes? I had told her when she moved in to feel free, to feel at home, and what's mine is yours. So I couldn't really get mad, but it started to annoy me for two reasons. It was getting kind of expensive since it was such huge amounts and, and it was always in inconvenient times of the day, like after an evening shift when the stores were closed and I came home hungry and she had emptied the kitchen for everything I had bought the same day. M had long black hair that was everywhere, all over the sink, the floor, the bathtub, etc. I'm no clean freak, but I think anyone could understand that this isn't the nicest thing to step in or see everywhere in your house. She also left her fingernails and toenails on the bathroom floor. There was also pee droplets on the toilet seat every time she had been to the toilet. I saw a silver fish on my bathroom floor. I've never seen one before. And they eat hair and skin and nails, so I figured this fella probably enjoyed life because of the new dirty condition my bathroom was in. At first, I didn't want to say it straight out because I thought it would hurt her feelings, and I didn't want to make her uncomfortable. So I just put a broom and shovel in the bathroom to imply that we needed to sweep the floor more often. This didn't seem to work, so after a while, I told her in the nicest way possible with a sweet smile on my face. Do you think we could try to clean the floor in the bathroom more often? We tend to lose some hair when we brush it, and I'm afraid we may get pests. I saw a silverfish the other day, and I don't want it to get worse. I also made sure to say we instead of you so she wouldn't feel attacked. She promised to think about it, but nothing changed. I started dating a guy and was head over heels for him. He was also in a roommate situation, so we had a tough time getting any alone time together. I asked him if there's any chance that we could get one night to ourselves every now and then in the apartment, and that she, of course, would get the apartment to herself as well. She didn't like the idea and claimed that she had nowhere to go, no friends or family. Now, I wasn't asking her to leave for 24 hours, just a few hours so we could just get some quality time together. She could just go to the library or take a walk or whatever. I was at work for eight to 10 hours, five days a week. So she got a lot herself. One of our old coworkers realized that this was really tearing at my mood to never get any alone time for myself. And I started feeling really suffocated. She offered that M could stay the night at her place. After all, they were friends too. M said she didn't want to bother her, but we told her that she didn't. They're friends. She's more than welcome. And I really just want one night to myself and, of course, my boyfriend. I didn't understand why she made such a big deal over leaving me and the apartment for just one night. She eventually accepted and spent the night there, and I spent the night away the next week, so she could get more alone time too. When I came home the next morning from my night away, I saw that my cat's water bowl was completely dried out. There was no spill on the floor, and it looked like it had been wiped out with a towel or paper. I had just filled it up to the brim the night before. I asked her how this was possible, and she said that the cats must have tipped it out, but there was nothing on the floor, like I said. My cats are overly social and usually cuddle up with strangers after just a few minutes. I noticed that the cats withdrew from her more and more over time. In the last couple of weeks, they never left my bedroom except for when they had to go eat and use the litter box. It seemed like they were scared of her, which I couldn't figure out since she was so timid. 
I had this old saucepan from the 60s that meant a lot to me. You probably wonder how a saucepan can mean a lot to someone, but it was my grandmother's, and it's the only thing I have that belonged to her. My mother used to cook for me with it when I was little, so it has a great nostalgic value to me. She burnt it one day and made no attempt to clean it. She just left it on the stove and went out to smoke. I found it ruined and cried. She didn't even say I'm sorry. She also broke dishes several times and didn't bother to replace them or apologize. This added to my frustration with her naturally. It had been probably gone two months now, and she kept waking me up at night, kept binge eating my food, never cleaned, never left the house, scared my cats, and ruined all of my things. I also realized she had stolen my prescripted sleeping pills, lots of them as well, and I only get one per night, not more or less. And as you already know, I really need them. I had 20 of them in my nightstand when I left for work, and when I came home, they were gone. She denied, which is pretty hilarious since no one else could have been there. My frustration was getting heavy. The summer heat was strong, and I felt locked up in my tiny bedroom with my two cats, never getting any time to myself. Never any time alone with my guy I was dating, except for once every 14th day. My apartment was messy, and she was stealing from me, etc. Out of nowhere, my old elementary school classmate texted me on Facebook, asking me how I knew M. He had seen that I had posted on Facebook that we were roommates now. I told him that we were old co-workers and that she needed a place to stay because she got evicted. He said, I know. Do you know why she got evicted? Yeah, she accidentally went into her neighbor's apartment. He said, that's not the full story. She broke in and snuck up to their sleeping baby with a knife in her hand. But luckily, the father woke up and wrestled her down and managed to save the baby. I felt sick to my stomach. Could this be true? It would certainly explain why she was evicted, but it just sounded so horrible, and she is such a timid, nice girl. I had so many questions. But my friend had the full police report. Apparently, the couple that M had broken into was his ex-girlfriend and her family. It seemed that M had a psychosis during the break-in, but those parts weren't public. It was, however, clear to me that she had been lying to me about what had happened and about how long she had been mentally stable. I started getting quite paranoid now, and I was already frustrated with everything and really wanted her to move out. We did, however, have a contract that she had 30 days notice. I knew that if I asked her in a harsh way, it would mean 30 days of chaos until she moves out. So I wanted to handle this as nicely as I could. I started looking for cheap hostels for her that I could suggest to her so she wouldn't be out on the streets. I sat down with her and told her that I loved living with her and I felt really horrible for this but I just miss my alone time and that the apartment is too small for two people. I also said it wasn't personal and that I wouldn't want to live with anyone right now and that I wished it would have worked out and that I'm really sorry and hope we will remain friends. She looked crushed and said that it wasn't possible. I showed her the hostel I found and said that I understood that it wasn't the ultimate situation, but I really needed her to move out because I felt suffocated and also the summer heat was making it tough to always have the door to the bedroom closed and that it was tough for me to not get any sleep, etc. She said okay, she was going to try to move out, but not until 30 days had passed, and I said of course. The first night after our talk, she got up and made her coffee at 2.30 a.m., I nearly had a mental breakdown. I was going to get up at 6 and couldn't go back to sleep. I asked her in the morning 
for probably the tenth time to not make coffee until I get up, but she didn't even answer me. She just sat on the sofa and stared out the window. I said, M, and she kept staring. I was freaked out, but left for work. She kept being weird, kept making a mess, kept waking me up, kept eating my food. And all I could think about was the incident with her and the baby and the knife. I eventually got so pissed off at being woken up by the coffee maker, so I unplugged it and stored it in my attic, which she had no access to. It may be childish, but I was getting so tired at this moment. My sleeping pills were stolen, and I was starting to feel like Edward Norton in the beginning of Fight Club. Well, the next night, I woke up at 4 a.m. by her making coffee in a saucepan. Not my grandmother's saucepan. That one was ruined. I tried talking to her again, explaining the situation, but she kept staring away and didn't respond. Me, being frustrated and on the tipping point, took the saucepan and stored it in the attic as well. I know, I know, but I was going crazy, and I just wanted her to stop with these nightly coffee routines and get the damn hint. The third night, I had a guy I was dating sleeping at our place because I was getting really paranoid now over her weird behavior, not speaking to me, just staring out in the space, etc. I woke up from my very light snooze by him poking me. He whispered, Look. In the doorway, M was just standing silently staring at us. This was like a scene from a horror movie with her long black hair over her face. I kid you not. I didn't say anything at first because I wanted to know if she just stood there for a second doing something by the door. But I realized after a while that she was actually just standing still, staring at us. It reminded me of the ending of Paranormal Activity when Katie just stares at Micah in the final scene. So I sat up and said, what are you doing? And before I could finish that sentence, she just slammed the door shut, and I heard the sound of something metal falling on the floor and her running into the living room. I yelled out, You need to leave! And started crying hysterically because this was turning into a fucking nightmare. Of course I didn't go back to sleep, and I was really happy that I had company that night. I just kept asking myself, has she done this before? Stared at me in my sleep? The next day, when I got out of bed, I opened the door that she had slammed shut and saw a kitchen knife on the floor. So that was the metal sound I had heard before she ran off. I took all my knives and locked them in the attic as well. I then asked a friend of mine to come to my house and be here when I tell her that she has to move out immediately, that I can't wait 30 days. At this point, it was 27 days to go. During the conversation, I really tried to stay calm. I know that she has a mental illness. I know she means no harm. Even though I was so frustrated, I couldn't hate her. I was mostly scared and tired. She, however, didn't even answer when I talked to her. She just kept staring out the window. She left the apartment and sent me a text instead, saying that I was disrespectful for bringing a friend over to her place. Nighttime came, and I thought this would be a quiet night finally. No coffee maker or saucepans. But at 3 a.m., I woke up by her burning dry coffee powder in a frying pan. At this moment, I just felt terrified of her. Her face was dead, her eyes were black. I suspected that she had gone into a psychosis. I stopped the fire and she just ran off into the living room in silence. I knew she had an appointment with her psychiatrist the next day. And while she was away, I packed all her things. I then sent her a text telling her that she needs to pick them up and give me back my keys and that I will give her money for a hostel the upcoming 26 days. She never replied. 
The guy I was seeing came to keep me company in case she would fight about it. She didn't. She left the keys without looking at us and left. Our co-workers who were friends with us both told me that she moved in with a guy that she was dating and she stayed there for a few weeks till she somehow amazingly got an apartment of her own. She started working again and I was really happy to hear this. She seemed to do well. Then in January of this year, one of our old co-workers told me that M had called her and told her that everything must burn, that she has a baby that she must save and other delusional stuff. She had called 112, that's the Swedish emergency number, it's like 911, about this, but they hadn't taken it seriously. M had then proceeded to burn her entire apartment down because the voices in her head were telling her that she has to burn everything to save her friends and family. Her neighbors had tried to rescue her from the fire, but she had fought them off and ran back in and poured liquor on the fire to make it burn more. She was arrested and sentenced last week for aggravated arson. She will serve her time in a mental institution, prison, for a long time, possibly forever. What's ironic is that she will probably be in the facility where I used to work and ended up where she used to work herself. My old co-worker had a witness at the trial and apparently she had stopped taking her medication, Amplify, because she thought that it made her feel numb and she thought she was stable enough to function without it. Apparently not. She also stopped taking her medication the last few weeks when she stayed at my house. So when she stared blankly into space, she was going into psychosis. When she stared at me with that knife in her hand, when she burnt the frying pan last night. It's disturbing to think about what would have happened to me and my cat if she would have stayed, or if I would have been a heavy sleeper. I also think about what would have happened to that baby that she snuck into before she was evicted. And yeah, I know it's crazy that I didn't just throw her out by then. It was complicated. The reason why I haven't been able to talk about it with my friends is because they sympathize with her and have minimized my experience and that they think I make a bigger deal out of it than I believe it has been. I sort of understand it since they have never seen that darkness in her eyes that I saw those last couple of days. Update, May 16th. I just remembered some other things that I wanted to add to my story. There were several times when I was going to work early in the morning that she occupied the bathroom by taking long baths. I patiently tried to wait till the last minute before knocking and asking if she could get up and go back in after I had gotten ready and left for work. Just another thing that added to my frustration. I fell really ill one time when she was staying there I didn't know at the time what it was, but I woke up early in the morning one day, feeling very nauseated. On my way to the bathroom, I literally shit myself and threw up at the same time. It takes like 10 seconds to get to the bathroom, so you can imagine how bad it was when I didn't even make it. I had a really high fever and kept throwing up and shitting myself all morning and Anyone who has had this illness would understand that you want the bathroom to yourself. Actually, I think it's pretty understandable that you'd want to be completely alone when you were this ill. My head was spinning and I was nearly hallucinating from the high fevers. One random thing I laugh about today is that it was Eurovision week. And for some reason, the flute solo from... The Dova song was stuck on repeat in my head while I was in and out of fever dreams. I have had a hard time listening to it still to this day. Anyway, working in healthcare, I also have a natural instinct of not wanting to spread infections. So my first thought was that besides wanting to be alone, I didn't want to risk giving whatever this was to M. So I begged her the moment I noticed I was ill to please leave for her own sake. 
I could barely speak because it made me throw up that easily. Our friend in common had asked her to water her plants that week, so she had the keys to her place and could have been there alone. M refused to leave, and I swear if I had the energy to slip out of the window and fall to my death, I would have, but I couldn't. I was half sitting, half laying on the toilet with a bucket in my lap, my head sort of resting in the bucket of puke because I couldn't hold it up with this high fever and just begged through whispers for her to leave so she wouldn't be ill too. I told her, what if you get sick too? We can't share the toilet. I will be in here all day. You should go to your place before it's too late please. Eventually, she left, pissed at me. It turned out I had a severe case of food poisoning, and I was well again after two days, but my God, the fact that she refused to leave is something I felt I had to add to the story, because it made me so freaking frustrated. I also went through our conversations and saw me asking her how long the door had been unlocked. That reminded me that she used to shut my cats inside my bedroom while I was away, at work or wherever, so they couldn't eat, drink, or use their litter boxes. She claimed she just recently closed it because she was trying to sleep, but I remember she did it in the middle of the day, one time, the last few days, too. So, to M, please stay out of my life, and I hope I never ever meet you again. This happened a long time ago. I was about petite and small girl, and I was only, I'd say around 18 and 19 years old. And I worked at a junior food store in Kentucky. There was a couple of incidents that happened to me in the short time I worked there. I have several other stories, but those are for another time. The store was somewhat isolated, and I was left all alone for most of my shifts. My manager, who happened to be married, and another employee that happened to be my manager's best friend would leave to meet up with their boyfriends. Some of my duties consisted of sweeping the parking lots and measuring the gas after closing at midnight. I hated doing this by myself. There weren't any other businesses open anywhere close to me. This was back around 1984, so of course there were no cell phones. I was very naive at that time. One night I received a phone call from a man asking if we had any Playboy magazines. I informed him that yes, we do, in Playboy and a few other magazines. He asked me who was the centerfold in the Playboy. The phone that I was using was a cordless phone at that time. I politely told him to just wait a minute. I looked at the magazine and told him the name of the model. He then asked me if her female parts looked juicy. I froze and then hung up on him. Thank goodness he didn't call back. It scared me so bad and I really felt like an idiot for even looking at that center fold for him. The second incident was a lot scarier than the previous one. When I was hired, I had been instructed to call the police if anyone stayed out in the parking lot for more than 15 minutes. There weren't many people that came into the store after dark. And that night, I was scared for my life. It was no difference. I had completed my duties at the time and was just waiting until I could close the door and go home. A man pulled up right in front of the door in a light-colored car. I have never been able to distinguish the make and model of any car. I waited for him to come in, happy that someone would break the silence of my shift. I could see him as I stood by the cash register. He was leaning over, looking at himself in the rearview mirror. He continually wiped his face with his hands. I couldn't see anything on him from where I was standing. I immediately got a really bad feeling about what 
he was doing. When he had pulled up, I had glanced at the clock, and time was creeping by as I watched him wipe his face over and over. I waited 15 minutes and then called 911 and told the dispatcher about the situation. In no time, two police cars pulled up and confronted the man. I watched them handcuff him, but didn't see anything else due to the fact another customer came in to buy some gas. It seemed like forever before one of the officers came in to thank me for calling them and to ask if I was okay. What he told me next made a shiver run through me and my blood run ice cold. He informed me that the man had been wiping blood off of his face and there was a huge butcher type knife with the handle broken off and it was covered in blood as well. He said the man appeared intoxicated and since his car was running, they arrested him for DUI. The officer added that they had contacted his family and everyone appeared okay. He added that he didn't know whose blood it was, but they would continue to investigate to see if they could find someone that he had apparently hurt or possibly killed. I never heard anything in regards of the case. I realized that anything could have happened to me that night, and I quit shortly afterwards. So phone guy and bloody guy with a blood-covered knife. I hope I never see you again. This is a story that pops back up into my mind from time to time. I've only told it to a few people, but I definitely feel like it deserves to be read to you. It's for sure one of the scariest moments I've ever had as a child. Back when I was around 10 years old, my mom finally decided that it was time for her to start taking her driver's license. When she began taking lessons, she was struggling a lot. For that reason, my dad decided that he wanted to do some practice with her besides the official driving lessons with her instructor, just to make sure that she'd pass the upcoming test on the first try. My little brother and I were attending swimming lessons at this nearby university at the time. Behind a forested area near the university lays this huge student parking area surrounded by trees, which turned out to be basically empty every weekend. My dad saw the opportunity to take my mom here to drive around for a bit and brought my little brother and I with them since we were too young to stay at home alone. We brought a football with us. When we arrived to the parking lot later in the evening, my parents began their practice. My little brother and I quickly got bored though and asked if we could go over to this little grass field on the side of the parking lot to play some football. My parents led us since they'd always be able to keep an eye on us whilst driving around. After playing for some time, my parents ended up driving around in the other end of the parking lot. They were approximately three to 400 meters away from my brother and I. Suddenly, this white Toyota pulls into the parking lot. We were playing almost right at the exit or entrance. The car turns around and stops on my right side with the vehicle facing the exit. The driver rolls down his window and presents himself as Thomas. He looked friendly was good-looking and young. Uh, I guess maybe around 30. This is where things started to get weird. On the passenger seat was a woman covering her face with a newspaper. All I could see was long blonde hair. And on the back seat was a baby sat in a baby chair. Thomas immediately states that he's from the police and that we had to get in the car immediately as he asked to talk to us. My brother actually took two steps towards the vehicle, but I stuck my arm in front of his chest as I was sensing something was off. The woman was still covering her face at this point and not saying a word. Thomas then raised his voice and told us once again to get into the car or else he'd have to come out and get us. My brother and I froze in fear. Suddenly, the woman put down the newspaper showed her face and told us in the most calming 
motherly voice, too. Just listen to the man. The woman looked young, pretty, and like a person who wouldn't hurt a fly. At this moment, I began screaming as loud as I could. What we hadn't seen at that point was that my dad was already running as fast as he could towards us. He was coming from behind the vehicle, so we didn't see it. My parents didn't have time to drive to us since the road down the parking lot was twisted all the way. When my dad heard my scream, he started yelling as loud as he could. Hey, who are you? Get the fuck away from my children. As soon as Thomas heard my dad and realized my brother and I weren't alone, he threw his car into gear and took off as fast as he could. He most definitely looked like a person who shat himself when he saw my dad. My dad was furious and told my brother and I to hurry up back to the car. He didn't even think about calling the police at that point. He wanted to beat the guy up himself. That resulted in us driving around for the next hour trying to find him before my dad cooled down and decided that we should all just go home and call the police. We never found out who those people were, but this episode taught me to never judge a book by its cover. Police can be the most friendly looking people in the world and still wish evil upon you or the ones you love. I'm not sure what these people would have done to us. I am sure about one thing though. They definitely weren't from the police. So, Thomas the fake cop and the hiding woman behind the newspaper, I hope we never meet again. And that, dear listeners, brings it close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes along with the gifted membership. Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Jova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugared Spite, and Anita V. Thank you all so much for remaining the pillars of which this channel stands upon. I deeply appreciate your support. And now for our gifted memberships. The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Gregg, Nat Davies, and The Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all so much for your support as well. To the other subscribers and listeners, thank you all as well for supporting Back to Ashes because without you, I don't have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.